Most YouTubers who do an engine swap just slap a thousand dollar Holly Dash into their build and call it good. But I'm not made out of money. I can't afford a six figure build and I prefer doing things myself. So I'm just gonna build my own. I swapped a giant diesel engine and this tiny little Explorer, but a Ford Explorer dashboard can't talk to a Cummins engine. I'm driving this thing blind. I have no idea what's going on with the engine at all. To make it worse, the first time I drove it, the thing started stalling and I have no way to troubleshoot that. I decided the easiest way to troubleshoot it would probably be if I could watch my fuel pressure while I was driving. And I needed a dashboard in this thing anyways, so that brought me down this rabbit hole where now I'm building my own electronic dashboard. The goal is that I wanna do this really cheaply, and I wanna do it with this infinitely expandable open source solution where I can add all the sensors I could ever want, and it'll all work with this little system. There'll be no third parties telling me that that sensor is incompatible or any nonsense like that. And while I'm at it, everything I learn, I'm gonna share with you guys. All of my code and project files and schematics, I'm gonna post on buildautomedia.com slash Arduino dash, and it'll be there for free if you wanna follow along. Sorry, Holly. I'm sure you'll never be sponsoring me after I do this project. This video really pushed me out of my comfort zone. I mean, don't get me wrong, putting a 1200 pound engine where a 400 pound engine's supposed to go, that was pretty challenging, but it was mostly challenging in a elbow grease and lots of effort kind of way. This was the first video where I actually needed to learn a lot of things in order to make this work, but more on that later. In the last video, I made the brains of the system, which was the Arduino. And in this video, I want to install the eyes of the system. I need to actually display this information. That is where this next Neon touchscreen display comes in. Originally, I was just going to cut a hole in the dash and mount a screen there, but I realized if I remove the speedometer, I can actually make the screen fit in the stock dashboard really nicely. The speedometer was mechanical anyways, and I don't have a way to drive a mechanical speedometer, so replacing the speedo with an electronic display makes sense. This way, if I can find a way to make the Arduino drive the motor for the tachometer, I can keep this nice big stock tach while also getting all my other information on the screen itself. I think it'll end up looking pretty clean. My first goal is to get this screen installed, which means I need to figure out a way to mount it. I ended up designing a little mount for it and then 3D printing it. Once I have a way to mount it, I need to actually wire it. This thing needs four wires, two for power and two for serial communication. I ended up running a couple of regular wires for power plus a cut up phone line for communication. I figured with high frequency serial communication, using a wire that was built for this made sense. However, I am not an electrical engineer, so let me know in the comments if this was a terrible mistake. The display's harness got covered with a plastic cable sleeve for some added protection and then fed through the dash to connect to the Arduino. Next, I needed to actually connect my sensors to the Arduino. The Arduino has a little buck converter that takes 12 volt from the car and converts it to 5 volt, so I figured it'd be easiest to just run a 5 volt line from the Arduino into the engine bay and have some lugs available in the engine bay for 5 volt power. This will save me running a bunch of duplicate power wires to each sensor from the cab. The sensor harness got wrapped in fabric loom and then covered with a plastic cable sleeve. I made sure to run all the wires I need for any sensors I add in the future. Keep in mind when running power wires that they should always be fused. I bought an inline fuse holder so that this 5 volt wouldn't be a fire hazard. You always want to connect this as close to the source as possible since any wire between the source and the fuse is not protected. To get the wires into the actual Arduino box, I added another Deutsch connector. This time I put in a 12 pin, even though I only anticipate using about 6 of them, just in case I need to expand the number of wires later. Now comes the hard part. I need to actually connect all this to the Arduino in a way that it can understand. This is pretty easy for sensors like fuel pressure where it just spits out a zero to five volt signal and the Arduino can do an analog read to read exactly what's going on there. However, this is a lot harder for say the engine speed sensor or ESS where it spits out two pulses per revolution that are a little digital square wave at 0 0.8 volts. The first issue is that I can't miss any pulses. So rather than doing an analog read, I need to do a digital read where it's connected to an interrupt. The interrupt means that every time a pulse comes in, the Arduino will stop whatever it's doing, count the pulse, and then go back to doing whatever it was doing. So utilizing interrupts means I know I won't miss a pulse. But the next problem is that it's a 0.8 volt signal and the Arduino can't read a 0.8 volt signal. It needs like three to five volts in order to trigger. This brought me into a deep rabbit hole of circuit design and this is where things got hard for me. All I needed was to convert that 0.8 volts to 5 volts, but circuit design is not my specialty. In order to switch 0.8 volts to 5 volts and to do it quickly, I need one of these little doubles. These are called transistors, and they're kind of black magic. At least I thought they were until this video where I had to actually figure out how they work. This is what they look like, and there's a whole bunch of different types. The important thing right now is that there's three legs. 
A transistor is just an electronic switch. It takes a small current and uses it to turn off or on a large current. The way that they can act like little switches is because of the magic of silicon. Silicon is a semiconductor. That means that sometimes it's a conductor and sometimes it's not. If we look at the crystal structure of silicon, you can see it makes these beautiful repeating structures that are nearly perfect. All of its electrons are happy. It shares nicely with other silicon molecules. The problem is that this doesn't conduct electricity very well. There's really nowhere for the electrons to go because the silicone's happy exactly where it is. Pure silicon is a poor conductor. However, you can dope silicon. You can add little atoms and impurities all over, and these little atoms could be, for example, spots that electrons actually don't mind passing through. This is how you get different types of little silicon junctions. If you dope the silicon with something that causes these little holes that electrons don't mind passing through, you've created what's called a positive or p-type semiconductor. You can think of the p-type as being a positively charged little plate of silicon. If instead you dope it with something that causes electrons to be happy hanging out in this structure, you've created what's called an n-type. You can think of an n-type as being negatively charged. There's a bunch of extra little electrons hanging out in here. We call these little positive cavities holes, and of course we call the negative charged particles electrons. If you create a junction with some p-type silicon and some n-type silicon, then what this means is that if you have positive voltage at the p-type and negative voltage at the n-type, these charges match and then current can flow. The positive gets its holes from the plus and the negative gets its electrons from the minus. It's happy and current can flow. However, if you try to put negative to the positive side of the junction and positive to the negative side of the junction, if these charges don't match, well then the negative side isn't getting electrons, it's getting positive charge. And the positive side isn't getting holes, it's getting negative charge. So in this case, current cannot flow. Current will flow in this direction, but it will not flow in that direction. This is what we call a diode. It's simply a PN or NP junction of silicon. So an NP junction or PN junction is a diode, and that's its electrical symbol. You might wonder then, what happens if you take three of these little silicone plates and stick them together? What do you get then? For example, I could put an NPN together. In that case, it's almost like you have two diodes back to back, one diode here and another diode here. However, they behave in interesting ways. If I give this side of this junction positive and say this side negative, what that means is that current can now flow. But this does something interesting. Now this positive side, it has all those holes it wanted, and this negative side, it has all those electrons it wanted. What that means is that this circuit kind of just looks like this now. The P and the N are conducting, so you just get a conductor here with this n-type hanging up here. As long as current is flowing in this leg here, then if you connect more positive up here, then current can also flow from here to here. As long as this positive is more negative than this negative. Meaning, if this is 5 volts and this is less than 5 volts, then current will flow through this part of the circuit. Since from the perspective of here to here, you would have minus and plus. So this is a transistor and this is what its symbol looks like. We call this leg the base, this leg the collector because it will collect current from the high side, and then this side the emitter because it emits current from the high side. So base, collector, emitter. As long as current is flowing in this loop, then I will be able to get current flowing in this loop. This is how a transistor can function as an electronic switch. We can use a small current in order to turn off and on a large current. Now you might be wondering, why the heck are there resistors here? I was wondering the same thing. But when you think of what I just explained about transistors, it makes a lot of sense. It's not enough to just have positive here and negative here. If there's not actually electrons flowing through here, then that positive junction doesn't get its holes, and the end doesn't get its electrons. You actually have to have current flowing through this before 
this becomes a straight conductor. If I force current to flow through this resistor, then in order for it to get back to negative, it has to flow through this transistor. So I need this resistor here in order to make sure that current is flowing through the transistor. In fact, it takes about 10 milliamps in order to turn this transistor on, which means that I need to size this base resistor, let's call it RB, such that I'm getting 10 milliamps through the transistor to turn it on. The way you calculate that is just with Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance. I need I to be 10 milliamps, which is equal to my voltage divided by my resistance. In this case, my voltage is 0 0.8 volts. That's how you size this resistor. I'm going to call this resistor RC for our collector. The way that I chose to size our collector was I just based it on the fact that I know that my resistors are quarter watt resistors and a watt equals your current times your voltage. Therefore, the maximum current I could put through this resistor without destroying it equals 0 0.05 amps. If I want 0 0.05 amps through this circuit, then V equals I times R from Ohm's law. R needs to be greater than 100 ohms. Now the bigger R is, the better, because it means it'll heat up the transistor and the resistor less. So I just picked a 470 ohm resistor and plugged that into the circuit and everything worked fine, so that's what I went with for that resistor. It's the same with RB. You want it 1 to 10 milliamps, and my calculation came out that a 100 ohm resistor would probably work, but I went all the way up to a 1000 ohm resistor just to keep the heat dissipated through the transistor and the resistor low. So here we go. Here's the circuit that ended up working for me. As long as the base was at zero volts, then this just looks like an open circuit. If I read my voltage here, it just ends up being five volts. But as soon as the transistor closes, now all of the voltage in the circuit is being dropped through this resistor. And this spot here, I can read zero volts. So this gave me my voltage amplifier. As long as I connect my digital pin on my Arduino here, then I'm getting pulsed 5 volts and 0 volts depending on the state of the engine speed sensor. This is exactly what I needed, my little voltage amplifier. Now you might be thinking, why do I need this resistor up here? If I took that resistor and moved it down here, this circuit should function exactly the same. I was trying to do this for the longest time before I realized that when I do this, the most voltage that can be passed through the transistor is the base voltage here. I only have 0 0.8 volts at my base. So as soon as the voltage up here on N gets any bigger than 0 0.8 bolo volts, it stops conducting because now it's not negative to positive. Now it's trying to go positive to negative. And like we talked about with the diode before, this is NP. This is not PN. It'll only flow in one direction. And another interesting thing to know is that the current passing through this transistor here from here to here actually causes a voltage drop of about 0 0.7 volts in order, to, in order to pass through there. So I had 0 0.8 volts over here, and then by the time it passed through the transistor with minus 0 0.7 volts, I was only getting about a tenth of a volt on the output down here. And this is why it can't take the full 5 volts through here because it's this NPN transistor. This circuit here works well as a current amplifier, but it will not amplify voltage. The voltage will be lower on the output here than it was over here. So if all you need to do is amplify current and sync a bunch of current down here, then this circuit works fine. But if you're needing to amplify voltage like I was, then you need it to look like this circuit where you're measuring on the collector and the loads also on the collector. All right, so this is the magic circuit that I ended up with that does what I needed it to do. All of this was just so that I could take the 0 0.8 volt signal from the ESS and up it to 5 volts to trigger on the Arduino. Circuit design is obviously not my forte, so this was the thing that took so long for me to learn. But now I feel like I actually have an understanding of transistors. I feel like if I needed to build more things like this in the future, I actually could. I talk about this a lot on this channel, but I think the most important thing is gathering new skills. The more tools you have in your tool belt, the more capable you can be when you're designing project cars and just in general. 
And skills and knowledge are the one thing that can't be taken away from you. So this is why I go through all this effort to build these things myself rather than paying somebody else to do them. Because if you pay somebody else to do them, you haven't learned anything. So I tested this circuit out and on the bench it works. Let's make sure it works in the car. All right, it's time to finally test this. Let's see if I got all my wiring right. I'm gonna turn the key on and the screen should spring to life. Let's see what happens. Nothing? I am not sure what's happening there. Let me get my multimeter out and see if I can figure it out. All right, there was a ground I found that wasn't connected, it had broken, so take two, let's try this again. God damn it. All right, well, it works, but it's obviously upside down. Yeah, everything works. I'm just gonna have to go uh, reprogram it and flip it around. That is super cool, that is working now. I think this looks really good in here. For now, I've only got fuel pressure and miles per hour programmed, although I don't actually have my vehicle speed sensor plugged in, so this doesn't even work yet. But one thing I did program in, which I hope will be really useful, on this page here, I also programmed in a graph this is my fuel pressure over time. So it gives the number down here and then it'll graph it over time. I'm hoping that I can drive around with this fuel pressure graph up. And if I see any stumbling or anything, I'm gonna see if the fuel pressure was dropping on the graph to know if that was the issue. Well, that is super exciting. That is the first time that the tachometer has worked on this thing. And the fuel pressure gauge seems to be working too. Although I was worried for a minute that it wasn't actually working because it was just sitting there stuck at eight PSI, but I had tested it before and it was working. So I went in with my multimeter and measured it just to be sure. And yeah, it was just stuck at eight PSI. I would have assumed the thing was stuttering because I don't have grid heaters and it is freezing in here. But with that low of PSI, I'm wondering if it really is a fuel pressure issue. I might have just figured out my issue that stopped me from being able to drive this before. It really seems like fuel pressure is the issue. Regardless, either way, I am super pumped about that. I think this electronic display looks really, really good. And there's a whole lot more functions that I can add to it now, such as making it run my grid heaters and stuff like that, that I really need now that it's winter. So I'm pumped, hope you are too. If you liked this video, then check out my previous video where I built the Arduino system. Thank you for watching. Now. Get out there and build something.